Week nine is upon us. College football, as it usually does, is absolutely flying by. We love covering the games, love having games on every night, but we're going to look up and the season's going to be over. And David, I don't even want to get into it yet. Don't think about it. We're right here. We're grooving. But we appreciate you guys joining us. We love doing these Saturday specials, even if you're watching us on Friday evening. Uh, Very excited to welcome a guy that as an Auburn fan, I'm going to be honest, broke my heart many oh, times. Oh, man. <laughs> many, many times. He was 2002 SEC Offensive Player of the Year. Uh, hell of a player. A guy that, that won a ton of games, had a ton of yards, uh, you know, got eclipsed, I believe, by, by Colt McCoy against Kansas in 2009. But this man has, has held more records uh, than a producer. Former Georgia quarterback, David Green. David, man, thanks for hopping on with us, my friend. Hey, good to be on, fellas. Really excited about some football today. Definitely. Well, uh, we're going to get into our five picks here in a second. Yes. But there are some games on the periphery here. Um, you know, we obviously, you know, you look around the country, this isn't the strongest slate, but there's no such thing as a weak slate during, during the college football season. college football. No such thing as a weak slate. I, I want to start because, David, obviously I know, you know, be, having played in the SEC, you keep up with these SEC teams. And Hugh Freeze taking over in his first year at Auburn. You know, it hasn't been pretty as they're kind of going through. They got Mississippi State at home this week. Mississippi State hasn't yeah. exactly been the the golden team on the hill, per se. Uh, did beat Arkansas in an absolute barn burner 7-3 to three last week. Just, you know, <laughs> lo- looking at this game, Zach Arnett in his first really, you know, full year taking over for Mike Leach, who passed away. Hugh Freeze in his first year at Auburn. Uh, just a little bit about this game, and, and can you talk to our audience about you know, the, the time it takes to build culture, even in the transfer portal era where you can get really good players in quick, and how hard that is. You were on a team that won a lot of games. You had to have great culture in that locker room. Can you just speak to that? Yeah. No, and I tell you, so my my first year I redshirted, Jim Donham was the head coach. The team went mm-hmm. eight and four. Um, he had got fired right after my freshman year. Coach Rick came in the following year, I believe, um, I believe we went eight and four that next year. Then, the, then the, in year two, and you've actually seen this time and time again where coaches in year two have a lot of success. And so I think year one can sometimes be a struggle because there's a lot of times there's new coordinators, new system, new philosophy on doing everything. Um, but a lot of times if you've got some really good players that are there, these new coaches can come can come in and, uh, and have some success pretty early on. And that's what Coach Rick had. I mean, Coach Rick got to Georgia. Jim Donna could recruit now. He could – he could bring in some talent. And so, like, uh, from our situation, I mean, Coach Rick kind of – he brought that winning philosophy. I mean, he just got done playing a national championship and then walked into UGA's campus the next day. So, I know as a player, I had a lot of confidence knowing, hey, Mike, you know, as a coach we got coming in, he knows what it looks like. And he had coached, like, you know, Charlie Ward, the Chris Winkie. He's been throwing to Peter Warwick. I knew he knew what success looked like. And so um, – yeah, so you get these coaches that you know kind of bring their own system, their own way. The new coordinators bring a new culture, and if you got some really good players, they can have some success and pretty fairly quickly. Yeah, I mean, you look at what Dion did at Colorado, bringing in you know basically a, a brand new roster, and now there's no limits on you know you can sign 85 guys in a class nowadays as opposed to the 25 that you could back mm-hmm. in the day. Uh, you know, Coach Rick, we've had the the pleasure to meet him a couple times, and I've never heard anybody say a bad word. Uh, about Mark Richt. What, what did he mean to you and, and the type person that he is? And, uh, you know, just do you mind talking about him for a second? Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you this. He's as, uh, he's as good as advertised, if not better. I mean, I can, you know, as, um, as a redshirt freshman, I mean, I'm always forever grateful that here was his first head coaching job. And he, you know, he had had a guy, Corey Phillips, who had played the year before and had a lot of success. Um, and then when it came, we were battling out, trying to be the starter that first year in 2001. And then he selected me to be the starter. Even that was a little bit of a gamble for him. Mm. Uh, I'm extremely grateful because it kind of showed the confidence he had in me. But even more than that, I mean, just as a coach, as a player, you know, he loved you uh, as a player. And he generally did. Like he cared about you, cared about your family uh, and cared about your well-being. And it also meant, you know, if someone loves you, sometimes they come down on you pretty hard. You know, yeah. guys get in trouble. I mean, his punishments sometimes were pretty brutal. Um, but, and, and, and even, I mean, I, heck, I saw him two weeks ago. I was bowling with Pollock. Coach Rick had this fundraiser for Parkinson's and, um, and Crohn's disease. And here it is. He rents out a bowling alley. Just show you how loved he is in the Georgia community. 
he raised like seven hundred thousand dollars wow. in a bowling tournament. Right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. like who can do that? You got to be seriously loved um, yeah. in order to raise that kind of money in a bowling tournament. Was that it? how good? How good of a bowler is Pollock? Probably is he one of those guys? He bowled like two eighty. No, but he is pretty good. <laughs> no. Like you know, he's smooth. You know, Pollock's a big dude, broad shoulders. Mm. He flips that ball down a lane, has a nice little spin on it. See, I'm a Ooh. straight bowler. Me too. Yeah, me too. I, you know, the only thing I could not be as a bowler is the backhanded finger flip. You know those guys that just oh, flick yeah. it down the lane? No. Can't do that, man. No. Hey, oddly good bowler right here. I I'm keep like, hearing you're Oddly yeah, good bowler. Good. I like, keep hearing I've seen him throw weird, 280s, 270. 280? 280? Like, weirdly yeah, good like weirdly good bowler. That's like insane. It pisses me off every time we go. Yeah, it's just, it's weird. Like, it I, almost makes me uncomfortable. I'm surprised we haven't bowled together yet. We should. We gotta we make should. that yeah. happen. If you're over 200, you got game. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can figure it out. I can put it together. Yeah, I'm like a I'm like a two thirty five, two forty guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you bowl? Huh? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. I thought we were talking about golf, the yeah. golf outing. Yeah. Uh, David, I love hearing you talk about your timeline when you were in college. You know, red shirting first, and then being named the starter as a freshman. You can't be top five on the all times collegiate wins list unless you played a lot of football from early in your college career, like you sure. did. And that gets me thinking about Texas right now. You know, Texas six and one, uh, hosting BYU this weekend. And five and two. Uh, Quinn Ewers, one of the top quarterbacks in the country, very sought after, highly recruited, injured for the second straight year. Texas is going to go to Malik Murphy for this game this weekend. And I want your thoughts on the Texas BYU matchup. But, you know, Arch Manning is waiting in the wings. And, you know, the yeah. Manning family is very, very cognizant of what's going on with Texas moving to the SEC. Jake has pointed it out for over a year now that, hey, the plan was probably to redshirt this kid, have him be named the starter as Texas sort of emerges in the Southeastern Conference. But here we sit, Texas very much in the playoff conversation with an injured quarterback. How do you think Texas will handle this situation with a very young Arch Manning uh, back there at quarterback? Yeah, so if I'm hearing you correct, Arch is not necessarily the starter, right? You no, said Malik's going to play. Yeah, Malik yeah, Murphy's going to start. Play. And so, it I mean, sounds I'll like they don't want to blow his red shirt, but you get what? You get four, four games. Four yeah. games yeah. and the bowl game on top of that. So Arch Manning could technically play and still be red shirted. I think there were similar rules when, when you and I were in college. I sure. can't remember exactly what it was, but how do you think this will play out for Texas and Arch Manning right now? Well, I'll say this. I would, um, if, if the... The quarterback star, I think he said his name is Malik. If it's Malik, I would think he's probably on relatively a short leash. <laughs> if if Arch is as advertised and they think that this kid's uh, really going to be able to play and be be the next thing. Uh, it's probably a combination of um, of them trying to protect Arch and his confidence uh, is one thing. You know, you never want a kid to go out and play before he's ready. It can really rattle his confidence. Um, but, yeah, certainly if I'm Malik, and, but if they really think, hey, this kid is ready, they're just trying to hold on to his red shirt. I would say um, Malik better have some pretty good series put together. Yeah. <laughs> or I mean, because look, they're trying to they're trying to stay in the uh, the playoff picture here, right? So they got to yeah. win football games, and if they feel like they need to make that switch, um, he'll probably make it sooner than later. If if Arch is is progressing like uh, I think we as fans think he probably is. We didn't see a lot from Malik last week when he came in in yeah. relief of Quinn Ewers, but we have in the past seen what he's capable of. So I don't know if this is a situation where he comes in and balls and keeps the Texas train well, moving. Well, I mean, and to David's point, you know, it, it used to be that you come in and redshirt. I mean, redshirt's the best thing ever happened to you. It was great. I, I got redshirt. It was fantastic. In the NFL, you used to be able to wait behind guys before they put you in. Nowadays, with NIL in college, you know, you're paying these guys all this money. You expect them to come out as freshmen. And we've seen, you know, the Johnny Manziels of the world. And, and some of these other guys come in as freshmen and ball, but that's the anomaly. You know, I look at the NFL. I mean, Anthony Richardson starting day one, Bryce Young starting day one, CJ Stroud, which it's working out for the Texans starting day one. I feel like Jordan Love is kind of the last guy that actually got to sit behind and take his time before they just threw him out there. And you never know how somebody's going to react. But this is where having that strong offensive line and run game that Texas has going against a BYU defense that I don't believe in. They should be able to lean on it. I don't think Malik's going to have to do too much through the air. I think Sark does an unbelievable job of, of playing to his players' strengths. 
I don't think he's going to have yeah. Malik Murphy in a drop back game the whole time. I expect a lot of RPOs, a lot of, of one reads and let's get out, let's mm-hmm. ride if it's man, let's get out, let's take out. And I just don't believe BYU up front, and I believe in Texas. There's a lot of points in this game, I think. So I think the spread sitting at plus 17, plus 18. See, do you think BYU is going to score a lot of points in this game against that Texas? Well, I, I think they can score enough to keep it competitive. I really do. It depends on what Malik's going to look like on offense. Because if you're one, if you're a one-sided football team on offense, I mean, that, it's easier to scheme against if you're BYU. Malik has not proved it through the air. Yeah. If you go back last week, we'll see. Ought to be interesting. What I'm bringing to this game, it was not going to affect a lot of the SEC standings, but South Carolina versus Texas A&M right now. In your opinion, what head coach needs this win more? I'd probably say Texas A&M. I think a and has got to win this game. I mean, it's the ones with the deep pockets and the higher standards. You know, South Carolina, of course, they want to win, and they want to win the East, but uh, the expectations are a lot higher in A&M. Uh, and there's a whole lot more money floating around at A&M than there is in Columbia, mm-hmm. South Carolina. So I think that uh, I think the game for Jimbo is a little bit more important, in my opinion. I, I, See, I, I think no. I think bit. look, I think this must win. I'll be must honest win. with you. Look, I, I always laugh when people are like, oh well, you know, they're going to wait until the buyout, buyout drops. You know how much money these cats have? Dude, They've already got the crazy. money together to get rid of them. What do you think? I, I mean, look, at the end of the day. A and M's never going to have a money problem. Texas is never going to have a money problem. Some schools, again, you some guys got unlimited credit when they walk in the casino. A and M's one of them. All right, they got two planes waiting on standby. One if they get bored of the other one. So A and M is so much better than South Carolina. You're sitting at four and three right now, right? South Carolina is not going to fire Shane Beamer, regardless of what happens. Next year is going to be hot for him if it doesn't turn around this year, which I don't see how it does. But if A and M loses this one and you go four and four. With kind of all the the hoopla and, hey, we got experience, even with Wegman being hurt, Max Johnson having the experience being in there, I think they're going to fire him. You still got Ole Miss and LSU on the schedule. Tell, Texas tell, A&M does? Yeah, yeah tell tell David who you think uh, is going to get the A&M job, Jimbo. Uh, I think it's going to be Urban Meyer. Really? Urban Meyer. Yeah. yeah. I think it's be, I, if you're Texas A&M, why not? One, you got the money. The dude's a yeah. proven winner. I mean, look, a thirty for th- a documentary on Netflix isn't going to stop you from hiring this man. Yeah, right, it's the SEC. They want to. I thought you were going to say a documentary on Netflix isn't going to make itself. Come on, go hire. Yeah, a- I know they already <laughs> had one. Like I always right. say, this as an Auburn fan, I'll give them a thirty for thirty for a national championship any time of the yeah, day. Yeah, I'm, I'm all over that under at fifty. I got it at fifty three and a half earlier in the week. Yeah, I'm on it like a fat kid at a ding. But you know, South Carolina has been known to freak out sometimes. Well, see, that's the thing. That's what would scare me if I was an A&M fan. But I feel like the only way A&M loses, it, and this is what else would scare me other than the guys screaming in overalls. But it, if I'm an AM fan, the only way I think AM loses this game, because South Carolina is that deficient up front, is if they absolutely blow it. But who, who is a better candidate to blow a game than Texas A&M? Yep. Seen this movie a ton of times. I've seen it a ton of times. Or, yeah. or wait for it, maybe... Michigan could send people to see the signals, signals and send yeah. a scouting report in advance. Go ahead, take the low hanging. Hey, that's what Tennessee. Hey, that's hanging. what Tennessee's saying. That's the recent South Carolina hey. scored sixty three. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they'll find yeah. an excuse now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys want to pick these top five? Let's games? go, baby. Let's go. Let's Speaking go. about Tennessee, let's start there. Tennessee going on the road to Kentucky. Mm-hmm. I think Blaine, you and I had Kentucky finishing second in the East to Georgia this year, but Tennessee now has a shot at that. Keep in mind, Tennessee is still going to play Georgia. Tennessee is still going to play Missouri. Kentucky's already played and lost to both of those schools. Tennessee at Kentucky. How do you have this one going? Ah, uh, man, I, th- this is a very interesting. You know, we always talk about styles make fights, and and. And Joe Milton last week against Alabama, in my opinion, played about as good as he can possibly play. I don't think Joe Milton can throw the ball better than what he did last week in a big game on a consistent basis like this. So a lot of times you see this in Major League Baseball with pitchers. We see this in basketball with with shooters or guys that have a big game. That next game, you may come back down to earth a little bit. And Mark Stoops, we know how astute he is defensively. Uh, The only thing that's keeping me from picking Kentucky in this game is that I don't trust Devin Leary to throw the ball on the other side either. Kentucky is a one-trick pony, and it's a hell of a trick with Ray Davis. They're a 30% play action team. You're going to get a lot of eye candy to find if it's zone and man with Liam Cohen, who's the Sean McVay protege on offense. I think Tennessee finds a way. I actually like Kentucky to cover the plus three and a half. I think Tennessee kicks a field goal to win at what probably is the worst name home stadium in the country at Kroger Field. Y'all couldn't come up no with way. anything <laughs> better than I get it. What that's the most corporate name I've ever just call it Kroger. Just put Kroger on your jerseys. <laughs> just have a bunch of bag boys on the sidelines. You know, <laughs> some simple bills, truth man. pretzels. Hey, gotta pay the money. Bill. Give me give me Tennessee. It does. It does. It does. <laughs> but uh give me Tennessee to win. Blaine. Um 
You know, the one thing I've always looked at the Kentucky team that's kind of been fading this year is their defense. I mean, it doesn't look like a Kentucky. A Mark Stoops built defense. He gave up 38 against Missouri. So I'm going with Tennessee. I think Joe Milton has another good game. I think they actually put two halves together. And I like Tennessee to cover in this. David, Kentucky back-to-back losses hosting Tennessee. Who you got? Yeah, I've got Tennessee as well. I was I was at the Georgia-Kentucky game. Uh, came mm-hmm. expecting a four-quarter battle. And it was uh, out of hand from the beginning. Yeah. Now, look, I love Mark Stoops. I think he can – do more with less than mm-hmm. most coaches. I think he's fantastic. He's the best thing to happen to Kentucky football. Um, but I think, look, I hope Tennessee loses, being a Georgia guy, but I think Tennessee's going to win this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, clean sweep for me. I'm going to take Tennessee as well. I, I think that they're still, they're still, they still understand what they're playing for. Like the, the SEC East is still up for grabs, you know, if they can put together a good showing this weekend and play Georgia tight. So I'm going to take Tennessee as well. All right, Duke is going to go on the road to Louisville. Uh, you know, they were in that game against Florida State, Duke was, until Riley Leonard went out, uh, ended up losing. Uh, Louisville, we've talked about, overperformed much of the season so far. Who are you going to take in this one? Well, you know, Riley Leonard, I know we don't know if he's going to play or not yet. Even if he does play, I mean, the ankles just don't get better. Obviously, you'd rather have a low ankle than a high ankle. Uh, but when I look at Riley, one of his best attributes is his ability to run his ability to extend the play outside of the pocket and inside the pocket. He's a great improviser, really good third down runner. He can recognize man, knows when to take off, uh, creates a lot of problems for the defenses. But with, with, with him not having a ton of running ability, I like Jordan Waters. I like some of the pieces that they have in the run game. But this Louisville team defensively, which has surprised me, has really punched above their weight. They went toe-to-toe with Notre Dame up front were able to find a way to beat Notre Dame basically at their own game. I think this comes down to decision-making with Plummer at quarterback. And, you know, he's been kind of hit or miss. You watch him against NC State. He looks like, you know, Drew Barrymore from 51st State. It's like he just forgot everything. Then you watch him against Notre Dame, and he looks like Shane Falco out there when he remembered everything. So I I like Louisville to win this game because I'm going to default to the home team. Mm -hmm. But the thing that scares me about this pick is Mike Elko is so good at scheming defensively. When did and I know AM's pretty good on defense, <laughs> but losing Mike Elko, I think, hurt AM a lot worse than what, what a lot of people have thought. I think Mike Elko may be the next head coach at Arkansas if he isn't at AM. So I think it's going to be close, but I like Louisville. I like him to score a touchdown late to win it and then get a turnover to seal it. All right. How about you, Blake? Yeah, I think you get a good Jack Plummer this game. Um, I think the, at home, Louisville's just a different football team. Maybe you have Jamari Thrash, a receiver who's an NFL player. He's a problem. Player. He's, He's a an problem. NFL player. So uh, it's just. With, even if Riley Leonard comes back, is it, Riley Leonard has to be somewhat 80 to 90% to be who Riley Leonard is because mm-hmm. he, he's, a, he's, a he's a dual threat quarterback. So I like Louisville. It's going to be close, but I think after what they did against Pitt on the road and that performance they put on, I think they get up, bounce back. Don't sleep on Louisville's run game either. Jordan, he's, he's yeah, a he's nice. player. David? Yeah, I'm a, I think it's going to be a tight game. I mean, look, both of them have answered to Bell in big games this year and played very well. Uh, I'm actually going to go with Duke. I think Duke's mm-hmm. going to figure out a way to pull it out on the road. It's going to be a statement game for them in the program. I think they're uh, they're close to really hitting their stride, and this would be a huge win and, and, and a huge way in going in that right direction for them. I mean, both still alive in the ACC hunt. Both have one loss. I like divisions in the ACC. I like both these teams. I'm going to go with Duke as well. I sure would like to know if Riley Leonard, it, you know, what his status is, if he's, you know, close to 80%, 90%, anything like that. But, um, you know, you look at Duke, both of Duke's losses this year, that – that loss at home to Notre Dame, that was a really good Notre Dame football team, mm-hmm. and they had them beat. It took a fourth and 16 scramble from Sam Hartman for, for Notre Dame to beat Duke. And then, like we said, you know, they were playing. They were playing with Florida State on the road uh, until Riley Leonard went out. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to ride with Duke in this one as well, though. All right, we got a top 20 matchup here with Oregon going on the road to Utah. Utah, big win over Southern Cal last week. Yeah, well, USC, you are, they are who we thought they were, to quote Dennis Green. You know, it's the same team that Lincoln Riley's put on the field with Alex Grinch for, it seems like, the past 350 years. But when, when I, I love Kyle Whittingham, you know, what Bryson Barnes did last week, I mean, basically outplayed Caleb Williams, if we're going to be honest. But Utah is a physical team. How did they rise up in the Pac-12? They rose up with physicality. I know this is the renaissance year before the extinction for the Pac-12, and there's a lot more physical teams, but that's how Utah has been able to separate themselves from the other finesse teams in the past in this conference. They also typically have pretty good balance. I know this year, with Cam Rising not playing, 
They've, they've really had to kind of default to a run game on offense, try not to lose the game and lean on special teams and defense. But, you know, they were able to find some against USC. But how do you fight physicality? You fight it with physicality. How do you fight complementary football and balance? You fight it with complementary football and balance. And that's what Dan Lanning's built at Oregon. I think he's tried to build an SEC team out West, now going to the Big Ten. That decision looks a whole hell of a lot smarter mm -hmm. uh, with, with the style of, style of play that they have. So I like Oregon um, to actually cover the, the six and a half in this game. If it's a seven and a half, I'd buy it down to six and a half. I just don't think Utah will be able to score enough. I think this is the game that Bo Nix with his legs is able to create a lot because Utah, pretty good in the front seven, Pretty good in the back end, but I like the combination of Bucky Irving and Bo Nix. I think Oregon finds a way. Yeah, I agree. I think you. Uh, I think Oregon's the most complete team in the Pac-12, even with that that loss at Washington. Oh, don't let Washington fans hear that. Uh, well, I think neutral field. I'm taking uh, Oregon in that game. Um, Utah, great story. I mean, but you, you don't have enough. Right? The Barnes is not going to be the guy to get you over the hump against Oregon. Bo Nix, too experienced. Bucky Irvin, great back. They need to feed him more, in my opinion. And Troy Franklin's an absolute tree running around on the outside. He's an NFL guy. So Oregon's too balanced, too complete. I think they covered a six and, six and a half. I think you can almost play this up to two scores. Interesting. David, you see it going differently? No, I'm a, I'm a huge Oregon. Uh, I'm a huge Dan Lanning fan. I think yeah. Oregon's going to take care of business. I mean, Bo Nix is in his 400th game at quarterback <laughs> yeah. in college. Uh, I think between that experience and Dan Lanning, Look, I mean, look how far Dan Lanning has taken his program. You know, they played Georgia opening day last year. Murdered. And look how they progressed through last year to yeah. where they are this year. I mean, you know, his his coaching ability and way the direction that program's going in and the way he can recruit, uh, that program's going to be good for a long time. But I, I definitely think Oregon's going to win this one. Nothing surprised me about Utah's win over SC last week except the fact that I didn't trust my gut and pick them. But I'm not going to be emotional about that this week because Oregon is not the same as, as Southern Cal. And I still think we are headed for an Oregon-Washington rematch. I think Oregon will win the football game. But I don't like the six and a half as much. I don't mm. like the spread, but I will take the Ducks to win the game. Can I just throw something out here real quick and tell me y'all's thoughts on it? Y'all think Dan Laney would take the A&M job? No. If they threw, no. uh, you don't think Dan wants to come back to SEC? No. Oh, I think he's good, man. No, he could. Think he's good. You don't want, you don't want to go toe to toe with Kirby in the SEC. Look, well, look, look, you think Oregon? You, you think Oregon? You think Oregon can't throw money at Dan Lane? They got Nike. Nike bro. money. Yeah, man. like all those jersey combinations. Oil too? money, Nike money. <laughs> but I tell you what, he can re if, if he can because one thing Dan can do, he can recruit for I sure. Think if he feels like he can get a recruiting advantage at A and M, possibly. But it, yeah, he's got a good thing going in Oregon as well. It's like here's the, I always like people are like, oh yeah, he wants to come back to the SEC. Part of me is like, if you've been in the SEC and you can go to a place that's a big brand that's not in the SEC, it may be just better for career longevity. So I, that's <laughs> sure. I, sometimes I take the opposite end of it. Uh. Well, we got Oklahoma going on the road to Kansas Sneaky. this weekend. You know, we talked about Oklahoma surviving a scare from, from uh, UCF. I guess I'm not allowed to call them Central Florida or, or something like that anymore. But uh, Central Florida, not as big of a surprise to me as most people thought, but they did survive that. They're still unbeaten. Now they go on the road to a Kansas team where it sounds like Bean's going to start at quarterback. Yeah, you know, we thought Jalen Daniels was, was going to be healthy enough to play in this one. But look, Bean's got a ton of experience. I mean, it feels like he plays half the games every year with Jalen Daniels getting hurt anyway. Uh, what could Coach Leopold's done at Kansas. It's, it's one of the best coaching jobs. Uh, consistently now we've seen it. wasn't just a fluke last year. I mean, I saw what he did at Buffalo and transforming that program. Then coming out to Kansas uh, and, and doing what he's done. I think this Oklahoma team just knows how to win, though. I, I think Brent Venables, he's got the right DNA in that program. You look at what they did against Texas. You look at, you know, surviving against UCF. And, David, you know this. I mean, we all do. We played. You know, there's some games during the year that you just have to survive, that, you know, championship teams look back. Look at Georgia and Missouri last year. Sometimes you just got to survive games, and a win is a win. Uh, I know the weather's interesting here if you're looking at the over and the under. If the weather's good, I do expect a lot of points. I just think Oklahoma's run game will finally hit its stride a little bit get some big plays this week. Kansas is going to have to be playing catch-up. And if you're trying to play catch-up against Brent Venable's defense, event, you're playing with fire. And, and eventually you're going to get burned. I like this. I like this Oklahoma team. I like their DNA. Yeah, Bean is, as came out 11 hours ago, he is starting this. Football. 11 hours. Yeah, 11 hours to the dot. Um, so if Bean is starting this game, I like Oklahoma, and I love the spread. I don't think you're going to get the same performance. One hours of Oklahoma's all. Nine and a half? Uh, not, I, bet it, I bet it's already gone up. I bet it's already gone up since we talked. Because uh. um, you need you need, so you like Oklahoma. You needed Daniels out there for Kansas if it's going to be a, if there's going to be a fighting chance. 
Being a great kid, a lot of experience, but not a good enough to run against Dylan Gabriel and these boys from Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma gets up for this game because I don't think they got up for the game last week. Mm. I think Venables is going to have these guys right. I like, I like Oklahoma, and I like them big. David? Yeah, I had to get. I hate to go with you guys, but I'm pretty strong as well. I think Oklahoma's going to win this one. Um, I think it's just going to be too much. Like you said, I think they got humbled a little bit last week. And, you know, Coach, uh, Coach is going to – Coaches actually love that, right? I mean, when you when you win a game and you don't play your greatest, sure. there's a lot of good coaching points. Yes. Um, I think he's going to use that and Kansas is a, a very worthy opponent and and we know this, look guys, if you don't if you don't come ready and you're not at your best, you're mm-hmm. vulnerable to get beat every week. I mean, the oh, difference yeah. in one program and the next, even though there may be 20 points different in uh, in the rankings, there's not that much difference if you don't bring your A game. So, For sure. I think they learned a pretty good lesson last week and they bounced back. Yeah, especially when you talk about going on the road, which I'm interested to see if Kansas home field advantage plays a part here. But without having Jalen Daniels and all that he can do from inside the pocket, from outside the pocket, I'm going to go with Oklahoma as well for a clean sweep. That brings us to the game of the weekend. Georgia-Florida, one of the best rivalries in college football. (sighs) He's going to do it. Who has the guts to pick Florida with David Green on the show? I'm just glad you said it's the Georgia Florida game and not the Florida Georgia. <laughs> it's that that's deep. What all the, that's yeah. the it's that deep. Hey, look, it's, it's, that. it's like the Michigan Ohio game. That's the order of operations. All right. Yeah, I was going to say, well, he's going alphabetical, but that's not the case. <laughs> uh, just remember the alphabet. Look, Florida, I, we talked all offseason uh, about, you know, preaching patience to Florida fans with Billy Napier because mm-hmm. we expected a bumpy year this year, even you look at their schedule next year, it's like walking in your house getting hit with an aluminum bat. It's just, it's unfortunate and it hurts. But they've been punching above their weight. Graham Mertz has shocked me, one of the biggest surprises in college football to me. After watching him at Wisconsin, he's been able to kind of blossom in a system that is designed for a quarterback to be able to get in the pistol and run. It's, it's his own read, spread option type system that Billy Napier's typically run before he got to Florida, even though they are a downhill in in the run game, you get some power, uh, some gap scheme, some zone scheme, but this Georgia team not having Brock Bowers is is a big deal. It is a big, he's a security blanket. Um, but you go back and look, and I got to give a shout out to my guy Blaine Gilmer from Southeastern fourteen. Oh. Georgia's only had one third down over third and twelve. They've done an unbelievable job of staying ahead of the change and staying on schedule. They live in third and two. They live in third and three. Lad McConkey's getting healthier. I think mm-hmm. he's going to take over as that security blanket. But I am banking on Dominic Lovett and Ra-Ra Thomas to finally blossom into the guys they got brought over to Georgia to be. The knock on Georgia has been, if there's any knock on a team that's won back-to-back natties, is that they don't have enough elite receivers. That's been the thing, right? They've had to kind of survive uh, on scraps when it comes to wide receiver. But you got two proven commodities, and now the onus is on them. Amarius Mims coming back is huge. They're getting healthy in the running back room. Georgia can dominate this game and win by 13 because I think it is going to be a somewhat slower pace. I don't think you're going to get a ton of big plays. Both defenses are going to be fired up. You have two quarterbacks that I think are going to get protected a little bit. Uh, I do like Georgia to win, but I like Florida to cover, so give me the dogs. All right. Lane? I thought you were going to go. I thought you were going to do it. Um, the last time I picked against Georgia, they played Oregon in the season opener, and I told myself oh, I'm yeah. do that again. Um, I think Georgia wins this game, and I think Georgia rolls in this game. I think Georgia's one of those teams this year. It's kind of uh, You don't usually see what Kirby, they play down to competition, and they play up to competition. So I think they're going to get up to this game. You're getting healthy. You got Milton back at running back. Mims coming back up front. I like Georgia, but there's one guy who I think can wreck it. I think this, this Pearsall kid for Florida is nice. He's good. He's, he's and nice. I know the Georgia secondary is extremely good, but this Pearsall kid is extremely good. If he doesn't have a big day, I don't see Florida even coming close. So I like Georgia. I think the dogs roll on Saturday. All right, David, before you get to your pick, tell us you know, your experience with this game, what this rivalry means, and how you feel about it being sort of a neutral site game that's always in the state of Florida. Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's look, it's a great game. Being able to be – uh, yeah, you know, this time of year where there's so much on the line. I mean, this is a game. It's a must-win game every year for both teams. Always is. And, um, you know, seeing a stadium split in half, you know, the history of having two really good programs uh, with a lot on the line, a lot of really close games in the past. Um, it's a fun one to be a part of. There's no question about it. And so uh, you're going to take the dogs, obviously? Uh, Do we just pencil yeah, so you I'm in? Yeah, take the dogs. Look, I, let me tell you this. So – 
I've been extremely impressed with Carson Beck. Um, the way he's played on the road, the Auburn game was a huge step forward because a lot of Georgia fans, you know, the expectations are beyond high, right? Like nobody wanted Stetson Bennett to be the quarterback. Like even after he won the first natty, people were like, oh, he should have just went on and then he won the second one. Mm -hmm. The expectations are incredible. Beck's done a fantastic job. And um, it'll be interesting to see, like you said, the receivers we haven't had to rely on as much because we were feeding – Brock Bowers the majority of the time, right? He's getting nine, ten catches a game. It's going to be interesting to see who really steps up offensively from a playmaking standpoint, whether it's Ladd getting more touches, mm -hmm. Rosemary Jackson. Uh, we're getting a little bit healthier at the line. And, um, you know, and early on this year, running back, I mean, my gosh, there were guys that we had never seen before. Yeah, we're like receiver. wearing like 80 receiver playing running back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, getting snapped. So, look, I think Florida's going to hang around for the first half. Kirby does a fantastic job of making adjustments yeah. at halftime. I think we win by a couple touchdowns. And, um, and uh, yeah, but I think Florida, I think it will be respectable, especially in the first half. You know, usually if you have a situation like this where your best player is Brock Bowers, he's a tight end and he goes out, for Georgia would always be able to lean heavily on that run game. That hasn't necessarily, you know, we haven't been feeling like, oh, Georgia's run game is the most elite in the country like we have in the, in the past couple of years. But like you said, Lad McConkey's getting healthy. A lot of those guys, there's a lot of playmaking playmaking opportunity on the outside. For Florida, to me, if they're going to win this football game, they would need to do one of two things or maybe even both of them. Like, Graham Mertz would have to freak out a la Kyle Trask from the 2020 season. You know, 450 plus through the air with Ricky Pearsall with 150 receiving, maybe even a reverse touchdown, something like that. And then on the defensive side, like really get after Carson Beck. I'm talking about multiple turnovers in critical spots. And that may, it may take both of those things from Florida to happen. I just feel like Kirby Smart has done such an elite job on the recruiting trail to be able to stack these classes one after another. It gives them the depth to be able to have a star player like Brock Bowers go down. So I'm going to roll with Georgia as well, but it should be a heck of a game. Mm, definitely. I, I can't wait to watch it. Like I said, there's no su such thing as a weak slate, and there's no such thing as a weak guest picker when it comes Back to Crane and Curve. We got one of the best legends to ever do it, former star quarterback at Georgia, David Green. David, man, thanks so much for coming on. It's an honor to talk to you, man. Like I said, you broke my heart many a times, yeah. but now that I'm older and I'm, st and I'm dead inside, uh, it doesn't hurt as much. <laughs> Hey, I appreciate it, fellas, and go dogs. Definitely. All right, make sure you hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Enjoy the college football watching while you can because it goes by fast.